one of the, the changes is that, first of all, the, the, group, the main module core simply defines some spanning and libraries to be using. Right, so there's the, the main point is simply we use spring context, spring data at the center of spring JPA, these are things that we use in all um, libraries, and their current versions are simply all pointed out here so that we can reuse them and sub modules. And now we have one spot where we need to change the main configurations if we want to change one of the resources we're using. Then we have for all projects, we know that it's a Java project, so it's pretty simple to apply the Java project, right? Because I'm using IDE right here, and I'm expecting everybody else to use IDE in the future, just kidding. Um, I'm also putting the main publish license and IDE plugins here directly into it. And once we start supporting clips for those compose guys, for example, then we also will for sure have the, uh, the clips plugin here as a one that's shared by each other. So, The module itself only defines a handful of libraries that are used by any other sub-module. In this case, we simply use the Spring Framework for sure, then we use Logback for logging, SNF for JBridge, and we also introduce or use find box for specifying things like not now, so that you first of all can see when you're calling the API if it's okay to put in another root value or not, and you can also later on do some decent testing and then um, coverage tests and bug tests for it. And also the IP will support it. And for test compiling, you currently use JVM as we have before. So it's not really a surprise for most of the guys that are currently using our software. Um, the license is the same as we currently have, so it's the same kind of license module that we simply use to don't need to put in the license header all the time. We simply could push a simply could run a greater task. And then it's everything is on um, Those modules below here, as I said, integrate all that stuff. And then you have multiple levels of modules. So we start with um, JPA, which simply defines everything that we want to use with JPA, which is simply the Java persistent application kind of access layer. This is the same here, so we're using Hibernate for now, even if we know that we're going to get in trouble with Apache in the future. But I'm, for purposes of sh showcase examples, I'm using Frizzle, but we still are later facing Frizzle issues by blocking the commands and things like that. But that's not my problem here, because I'm not doing any of this stuff right now. And um, as you can see down there, there's one relationship. So this is the first thing that has changed. So you really only look here at JPA. There's nothing more than the module that covers JPA. And I've been using it as a depends on um, the dependency. I'm using context, which is simply some kind of dependent context awareness that we need to know which data gets to address. But this is a completely different module. So not legally that code, it's simply really sort of a library. So we take a look at context. It's even less than that. And if you see now, there's one task which is called publishing. And this publishing task is called all the time you build. And it simply creates a job file in your local native repository. And this one is used as a runtime and you can see the top of one. So this is not as today where we have simply one package and everything is below that one package. It's really using multiple small job files that you can compose into your portion of the module. If you don't want to use our context, you simply need to add your own context module and then you're good to go. So that's the main main idea behind that. And this is something you can see if you take a look at it. So let's go back. That's something you can see here. Bunch of published local naming, which is called internally automatically. So that if you build this one, it's published to the local naming repository, and then other modules can simply pick it up and use it. It's a different approach than before. 
So now let's talk about some of the core components. So I guess you, you all know that JPA is simply it's an abstraction to access databases. And all we offer for our first shot is simply a nice MySQL default configuration. So we have a configuration file in the same project where we can tweak your names and things like that, and then we use Java based configuration for Spring instead of XML based configuration for Spring, which allows you to, first of all, simply add that class to your class pen and you're good. If you want to change it, you could drop an XML file and call this XML file instead of our classes. Or you create your own configuration class, maybe you can it from, from our class or not, and do whatever you want to do with whatever kind of data it is. And I expect once we're having our first 0 0.1.0 version, <laughs> I expect that we will also start creating default configurations for, let's say, Postgre or for whatever kind of data it is. So that's what we expect. But now we're running with MySQL, we know MySQL. So this is why we simply start with my second. Right now there's one thing I'm not sure that we will do the same way as we're currently doing it. And this is the automatic way of migration within the data structure. That's what we do. The folks who are using my like, for Spring we are, we know that we use flyway and then we drop the new raw file. So everything will be automatically updated. And for small installations, this maybe is fine. But in the second you want to really want to start using the installation systems, or you want to run one or two clients on a, on a different data set, then you really got to start getting in trouble because you then need to start pushing them out and say, okay, this is another Tomcat, they're serving them their own way. And specifically, if you come to larger companies, most of them start complaining if you do something like that, because they want to do it. They want to know what happens in the database. And they don't want anybody to automatically do it. They want you to provide them some software that maybe boosts that magic then, but they at least want to take a look at it before anything happens. So that would essentially just be triggering flyway manually instead of triggering flyway automatically, right? Yes. And also um, maybe having the, the SQL files a bit more accessible than right now. So right now you would need to open the raw file and take a look at it before you really want to do it. So you need to unzip something and things like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? so um, because they're, but at the end of the day, yes, it would be simply triggering flyway manual instead of having it done doing the magic. Yeah, because ultimately I think it's the upgrade mechanism that takes flyway is still very useful. Yes. But we should not trigger it automatically. Yeah. By default. Yeah. So we should give you the possibility to do it if you want to, but on the other hand, it's, I think it's more decent if you can choose between manual and automatic. Because in development, to make it more confident, it's good. Because in development, uh, there will be a lot of people working. Yes. And I don't know what changes other ways have done. Yes. So I just simply want to make sure that automatically so that I know if you're executing the SQL site. Just like that, probably like a debug flag where you know, yeah. develop a flag and prod flag, like, for yeah. a flag. You already have that flag, right? So we use yeah. that. And therefore, and use that to, uh, and we also use that to yeah. figure out much bigger. So those are the, the only real change. Right? Everything is the same. So we use MySQL, uh, we will use Flyway, we will use the multi-tenancy database control because of the same words, even if sometimes our same team. We may will also be you know, maybe so for sure we the first step of the, the first iteration of the framework also will allow you to create databases on the fly instead of creating a SQL statement and then restarting everything. Right? Because we could also trigger Flyway directly, yeah, that would be two ways on it. That would be, I think, also a major improvement. Yeah. But that's all. So for JPA, everything stays as it is. Right? Maybe we get rid of the native SQL with the new version and really use JPQL or Hibernate or Spring Spring language where possible. So we could at least switch out databases. That's one of the main things. And um, so we will utilize JPA more than we currently do. That's it. Right. So the second data storage that we will support, of course, that's the second data storage that we will support is 
second database that we will support is Central ISO NoSQL Store. So this will be the default. The default that we will deal with. But it follows the same the same line of thought, right? So we will offer the Cassandra module. It will utilize Spring Data Cassandra, so there's no magic from our side needed. The only thing that is needed from our side is what kind of Cassandra, so where is it running? So there's some configuration needed for the configuration part, and that's it. And we've done something, I would call it special, because we also wanted to support the data store dependent for Cassandra, which is not the usual way we're doing it. So we simply stole the idea from the routing data source that was is already part of um, the JPA, the source of printing this case, and simply implemented something similar so that you could have multiple using the same tenant context and you could simply address the right, in this case it's, um, it's called the it's, uh, So Cassandra is more of a AWS friendly, like uh, you can have a kind of distributed database and stuff like that? Yes. Exactly. And what we simply do is we, um, we simply enhance the Cassandra session to be attended with the real Cassandra session factory so that we could also run multiple um, realms for tenants instead of having one big um, Cassandra running and then decide by tenant ID maybe what's happening. So it's the same, we follow the same approach here. And given that there's no flyway specific kind of Cassandra migration, we also need to implement that goal. So that we could use the highway like migration also to the center. So it does exactly the same. So it should be as easy as for JPA. But it's not flat. So I maybe think about taking what I've started working on for the Cassandra multi-tenancy and also for the for the flyway extension and maybe push it to flyway so that it's available there and can get rid of it into the right now for somebody else to Right, but for the first stop, we needed something, and so I implemented it. I exactly took the same approach as Cassandra, that's flyway, and we implemented it with Cassandra. How about using MyDB multi master replication with multiple tenants, I mean, individual tenants or individual databases, MyDB databases, and synchronized with a single? Yeah, so that's, that's what we will have. So we will have MyDB so both options, right? Yeah. No, that's not two options. That's simply we will both, we will utilize both. So the usual. Um, your usual relation of data structure will be side and will get or in MySQL. Right? And for the command processing and also for the journal entries, we will simply use a Cassandra on top of it so that we could simply reply fast and then start doing the magic or the rewriting of the databases after everything is settled. And that's what's faster. It's not blocking as MySQL is blocking. I already know that some folks. Facing issues with both MySQL and also with the Tomcat processing. So if I'm too fast, stop me. If I'm too slow, hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's take a look at how this maybe could look if we start using it. Right? So those are the top components. Oh, there's one component I need to talk about too. And this is the ASIN. This is another another kind of concept that we will have internally used. Um, and it's only a default, it's only a configuration, it's nothing really great about it. So I simply don't want it to open the system to have millions of asynchronous processes on it. That's what I just wanted to do. So I wanted to have a configurable way of deciding. How many threads do you want to allow in parallel? How many threads do you want to allow to queue up before you start saying, hey, stop, now it's too much, I could not have it anymore? And luckily, as you can see, luckily Spring already offers me some asynchronous processing, and I simply implemented that. So it's pretty straightforward. You use the internal thread pool, test, execute, <coughs> and you configure how many pools you would have in minimum and maximum. How, many, how large your team will be, and when you want the system to start learning that something that's totally wrong because your queue is now whatever kind of size and will never get finished. This line. So this is the so first will be at a platform level, right? Yes. So uh, 
that platform, for instance, uh, for the most part, uh, it will be will, will be even further. It will be per service, so you can decide okay, per service at the end of the day how much queuing, how much asynchronous thread numbers you can have. Okay. So every little service will use this asynchronous component, and you can simply configure it per service how much you want to use with it. Okay. So by default, you provide some defaults. You can try it and live with it or not. I can tweak it. Is this how you're anticipating handling uh, message queuing between instances as well? It's, it's first of all, internally message queuing between That's for the first question. Okay. So let's take a look at one of the projects that's utilizing some of that stuff. So, as you can see here, right, we simply have directly compiled dependencies, which is context because of the D2D2 line with tenant context I'm currently in, and it also utilizes asynchronous as my as a component. And for testing purposes, I also added our implementation of the central as a default implementation. So if you want to use your own, you simply put it into your compiled dependency and then you're good. Just for testing purposes, I use our equal implementation. And the main pieces of it are pretty straightforward. So it should be feel something similar to what we currently have. Uh, so first of all, we have two annotations. The first one is command handler, which simply defines the class that will handle the command. And then you would have another Notation which is called process, which is the method that will be called internally if we find a command. Then this method marked with process will be called. <coughs> you can have multiple or many methods that you want to have, but they won't want to get called except for one and one process. <coughs> what you need to do, and the class you maybe will touch all the time. Right, this is the class command gateway. So this is the one that's supposed to be the external API of the command, um, the complete command processing. And it offers two exposed methods, one which is called process, and the other one which is called process await. I guess most of you now know the difference between process and process await. <laughs> but I will explain it. So process simply means really this is asynchronous. This is fire and forget. You send a command and you don't care about the result right now. This is where process goes for. And if you call process and wait, then it will also have an asynchronous, but we will get the future object and return you the value once the future has fulfilled. So you can decide if it's really a fire and forget for your use case. And don't really care about the result at the end of the day, except that you want to maybe have hope that you want to get an exception, you know, an exception would something mean something went wrong. Right? And if you care about the, the result, then you will use process and wait. So we then really return you the decent information what happened. No. This is really a fire for me. You simply say process this command. That's it. Okay. But if I want to know that process figure out. So if the method returns without, so the method will return anyway, right? So we know that it's happened. Okay. Right? And if you want to know the real result, then you would use process and wait. So if you want to know what's coming back, take like process and wait. And if you don't care, it's really a fire for me. then you simply call process. So I don't want to go into deep into the internal things, right, because we're probably losing a bunch of time. Uh, but Marcus, yeah, is this process and wait a blocking call? No. It's simply using also a thread and using the future. So it's so running in, in separate thread, and it's waiting internally for the result and then returns the future object. But then, don't you think the name is a bit confusing? Because no. <laughs> <laughs> Could you be a little clearer? 
Yeah, I mean, the process and wait, it means like I have to wait, wait until wait, something even wait, 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 wait. That's the reason why it's problem. But it's from a browser perspective, it will be blocking, or from a consumer perspective, it will be blocking. Because you will have to be waiting and keeping the connection open, otherwise, you won't get the result. Right. It's just a way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just to show you um, how this could look like, right? So this is a really simple command. Just nothing else than simple like that. Right? But this is how your commands in the future will look like. This is the public class, that's all. You can do whatever you want with it, right? And you are responsible for your own commands. And if you take a look at the command handler, then you see like, specifically the two the two um, annotations I'm talking about. So this class is my access command handler for a single command class. So internally, we record we have a kind of registry, and once you once we see a command class coming, then we will call this command handler based on the annotation, and we will specifically call it this method. So this method could be of any name you like. It only needs to have the annotation process. And then we will take the command as it comes in and simply give it to you so that you can do whatever you want to. And it's pretty straightforward. And piecing it all together. Right? So this is my process command. So I create my command, I set a message, and then I use the auto write command gateway. As you can see, I use process and wait because I want to wait for the result. I put my simple command, and then I get my command response back, and I can simply take a look at whatever is in there and simply process it. Makes sense when we take a look at the accounting component because then I can utilize all of that stuff. And then we see how the flow should be, but it's simply one that gives you a sneak peek on the flow component before we try to create it. So the event mechanism is nearly in the same way. So I really try to, to have the event handling and events in a similar way like the command, so it's pretty easy to use. Simply a few things that are a bit different for sure. Right, so first of all, it's the event handler and the command handler. And it's a no-define on the process. <laughs> it's more than different. And one, one other difference is we can have multiple events handlers per event. So right now we only can have one command handler per command. So that's the huge difference here. That's the sure. right, So one command will be processed by one command handler. The result of by an event, and then you could have as many event handlers you like. That do something with that data. And everything is exactly the same. It's called the event gateway instead of the command gateway. It also has a. Let's go directly to this. So, as you can see, it's the same. Right? It's, in this case, it's publish and process and wait because I'm publishing anyway. Right? And, um, as I said, you will have multiple event handlers, and then you call publish and wait. It really waits for all the event handlers to finish. That's something you really need to be aware of. So if you have 20, 30, 40, 50, how many event handlers for that specific event? And they take their time, and you will wait maybe until tomorrow. Who knows? And so that's something you need to be aware of. Right? Yeah. Any questions so far for those core components? Mm -hmm. I see you are taking a lot of notes. I'm not sure that the next talk after. So as I mentioned um, in the morning, so accounting will be will become more of the back backbone of everything in the future. Right? So we have the journal. We have a ledger. And the idea is that, as you usually would do in a financial 
system, right? The journal is simply your tracking of ongoing transactions. And this is usually done by a clerk. <coughs> and the clerk simply enters James to Marcus to 200 euros. Okay, sorry, Marcus to James to 200 euros. <laughs> <laughs> and then he takes, then somebody comes from the back office, takes up that information, and really start putting it in the ledgers and in the right accounts. That's usually how it works. And this is how we also will now utilize the system. So the journal is the running thing that includes everything for you. And the ledgers are then the storage and the real sign up that it's happening. So it's really based on journal ledger. And it's created directly from the beginning of the instead of trying to mail it in the <coughs> So let's take a look at a bunch of those commands, right? And let's start with the create journal entry command, which is pretty straightforward, right? So I want to create a journal entry. And what happens here is, interesting one. So there's currently just no validation because it's already this part pretty straightforward POC code to show you what we are doing. Right, so what happens is that I create a journal entry entity, which is a Cassandra entity. I set a few things, I source, save it, and then I publish a journal entry created. Straightforward, that's all I can do. So Cassandra in this case is really my place of storing journal entries. And once I finish that, I simply fire them back and say, hey, I created a journal entry. Whatever you want to do. So let's look at journal entry created. So Cassandra is finished, I've returned, so you can start working again with your system because the journal is done. Right? And now the event picks in, and in this case, it figures out which journal entry it was. Takes a look at if there's an accounting note, so maybe that's some special one. Yes? Uh, so, I'm looking at how it can be, we can reduce the entry barrier for new partners to pick up the code base and to start uh, building around it. So, um, for example, scripting or Scala, the Scala language. It's not easier. It's really, so there's a few points. We had a long, long discussion about it when we were in San Francisco, right? So there are languages that are pretty fine if you want to use some small kind of applications, which is, for example, Ruby or, for example, Scala. Right? But if you want to start creating enterprise systems, you need to use some kind of enterprise language. I'm sorry. Even if this sounds harsh and maybe I'm ignorant or whatever, right? but you, you need to have a decent programming language and a decent framework. Yeah, I, I, to chip in there, I think ultimately we all see that a lot of people, and I was actually positively surprised by it, by some of the presentations and some of the things people have been doing on MIFIS uh, in the past year, year and a half. Uh, because we, well, people with little programming skill can start consuming the APIs in whatever programming language they prefer. Yeah. And once you want to move beyond that and really start like tweaking the core platform and tweaking the core of the code base and extending that, then I think you're already, well, should be serious enough to, to have some developers in-house, etc. because you, you potentially are going to do quite a lot of damage in the financial system, in that case, if you don't know what you're doing. But I might add to that, I mean, you're modularizing the code intensively, so if you can write a Java shell for whatever language it is, um, then you can program in whatever language you want at that point. <coughs> something I wanted to say. Thank you. So is that good or bad? At the end of the day, it's your responsibility, right? So if you decide in the module that is not part of our current, whatever you want to call it, release, right? And you want to go with Ruby for it, then simply go for it. But you will never get into our code base. So if you want to get into our code base, then we need to talk because then we need to really make it as part of our platform, sticking to the same rules, right? And also, covering the same policies that we have, because 
as Sutter said, we're talking about a financial solution, so it needs to be secure. It needs to follow a specific set of rules. And if you now start mixing and putting scripting into it and allowing everything, then we maybe will get in trouble once we really want to start getting regulated by somebody. I'm looking at something like a, a framework or a mini framework, which is uh, pretty front door and it's working easy. Like a Mythos framework. That's what we can do. So you could simply pick these as libraries and create your application on top of it. For example, if I want to build an Android app. You would use the API. Yeah, so so I have something which I can uh, use and which... Uh... So this is something I would I would like to point out to Bartek, right? Because they're doing it the way I want to do it in the future. Right? So Stella has something written in some weird language. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a mixture between low and C, right? Uh, so you are talking about uh, which components? Of so if we talk about Horizon, it's mainly C, right? Uh, it's in Go. It's in Go, right? So there's Go and there's some C parts. Yeah, but actually, as a developer, uh, that's that's what I wanted to say. You would never right. use, you know, this this tool. You, you will use API and SDK that is using the API. The that's server. exactly what I wanted to say. So we will have our running backend. We need to have policies and regulations on that backend so we can be kind of sure quality and security. But if you want to use it with another language, that's what Bartlett is working on. So he's creating a Java SDK. He's creating a JavaScript SDK. But I think you're also working on a Ruby SDK. Or something. Uh, no, 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 no. no I'm not a there is, or there is yeah, a, yeah, yeah. But there's a Ruby SDK, yes. for example, too. And this is where we would take it then. But first of all, we need to make our own work. Then on top of that, we will simply provide the same wrapping APIs in this case, SDKs, as our friends. So long story short, basically I'm looking at uh, building a uh, Mythos shell on top of Mythos, mm -hmm. which uh, I can then use to explore Mythos, or someone can use to explore Mythos, and if I want, I can release that back. Uh, so this would be a runtime discovery shell kind of thing. Mm -hmm. right? So I could discover, first of all, the API, and also I could discover the, uh, the platform itself. So in this case, we so, need a so what is the best way to do that? Right, so I mean, Perl I could use for the, the API share, right? right? So I say, for example, um, Mythos list tenants. Yes. Right. So, uh, or if I just type Mythos enter, I have a shell where I can say list tenants. Yes. Okay. And then go uh, tenant one or to go go to default, right? And then I can say list whatever star or clients or whatever, right? Now this would be the Perl, probably Perl or Ruby would be a good choice for that. But if I want to build like a discovery shell for the platform itself, which works at runtime. What do you mean by discovery shell? Because this makes a lot of Instead of having a monolithic uh, platform, yeah. if I want to build plugins which can plug into the platform, which I can then build. It is so many plugins. That's the point. Do I have separate uh, kind of Yes. I mean archives. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean artifacts rather. Yes. That I can have which combine with this. Right. Okay. That's exactly what we do. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. for <coughs> messing everything up, and hopefully we can find some nice little jams that we can do. That's okay. Sometimes uh, the bazaar also helps. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the cathedral versus the bazaar. So yeah. But the the bazaar won't be too small. So there won't be too little pieces, right? So we had a nice. So Ashok mentioned that that um, one of his partners for the payment processing created microservices like Helm, and they all have tiny, 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 tiny little micro microservices that talk to each other, and now they start facing transaction, spanning transaction issues because every process is done in itself, but it's not big enough to cover a complete transaction. So if something fails in the middle, you simply screw it up, and then you need to. We try transactions or revert transactions and things like that. And this is so I think the the reality is somewhere in the middle. Right? So we don't want to have a monolith again for sure, but we don't have two small pieces that then maybe start making in the trouble. So you will have full fledged services that do a specific business value. And they will do this value from A to B and not from A to A, not from A to B. And so that's the main thing. <laughs> How do we deploy all these things in the different multiple servers? How do we deploy? Well, this can be deployed on multiple servers, right? on multiple instances. 
Each module can be running on a different one. Right. So this is a new, yeah. this is a component that I didn't show here, but so we will utilize the Spring Cloud framework. So Spring Cloud offers a discovery service and offers a registration service and also a configuration service. So you even could have your configuration distributed. And the framework itself connects you internally without letting you know to the, the correct registry discovery service. And you only talk to one instance, and then you get that any instance which is there. Pretty high level. You could take it a bit deeper, but we could talk about two hours about that specifically. So when we um, utilize this framework, we'll talk about it again. I don't know. There's so much stuff out there. So, maybe to give a bit more information. So, everything at the end of the day will be the Spring Boot application, right? And by default, we go with Jenny instead of Tomcat, because Jenny is the Latin language. And the Spring Cloud framework simply, um, you tell it that I'm applying for a specific cluster. And then, once it's run up, it simply calls the registry service, which is there. And registers a component. So if somebody's asking for a component using the same client approach, then it simply goes to the discovery service, and the discovery service figures out which one is the one you really want to talk to. And so it's wrapped up because it's utilizing Spring Boot. So no Tomcat installation center. Dropping the war file. It's a bit more than dropping the war file, but dropping the war file. That's something um, I'm currently trying out. Can you repeat, repeat the question? Please. No. Yes. <laughs> no. Yes. I'll go on. So, so he was asking which kind of discovery service we planning to use. So the most popular currently is Eureka from Netflix. So Netflix uses Spring, Spring Cloud, and AWS to, I'm sorry, to serve all streaming around the world. So they're running everything they're doing on AWS with um, a bunch of instances, a bunch of regions across the world, just a, just a few more. And they implemented their own discovery service, they implemented their own configuration service, so Eureka. And they also um, provided something they call the circuit breaker. Circuit breaker. Circuit breaker. That simply allows you for specific events to say, okay, let's say you open Netflix, and you got your recommendation panel down there, so what you maybe could look next on. Right? And if this service is not available, they simply have a circuit breaker that provides you defaults instead of asking the service because the service is not there. And they implemented that, they tested it, and then they open sourced it and gave it to Spring. And Spring is using it a lot in their Spring Cloud environment. And there's another tool which is called Consul, right? which is a RAF protocol based, doing the same thing, it's a bit more lightweight. And you wake up because we want to use Spring Cloud with the Netflix stuff, and it's not only one component. So we talk about three components or four, depends on what we really want to do. And I think this is maybe usually too much for the usual installation suite. So console is doing the same, maybe not that sophisticated like you have, but it's still it on the one component. So it's easier for us for maintaining the software and providing um, deployments by simply having more components that we can afford to use. Database, are we planning to have one single database? Or like, even every microservice will have its own uh, database? If I'm one single? So, like, so it depends on one single. So you will have a database pretending. But I don't want to start having multiple databases for service. I don't want to start that because then you will get an error. Because then you really get in trouble if you start moving data somewhere because it's not consistent anymore. But you would need to, you should have a master. Will that become an important Because it's simply having somewhere in the background. Nobody's caring about it. Because the, the real stuff that is expensive is happening on a cluster with no single memory cluster. Ultimately, it's about getting consumers fast feedback. So that they can keep working in the application because that's where the big delay and the frustration is. And as long as you can ensure that you get that 
piece of enough information that's accurate enough at the time. Then, and then we can now make sure that everything is still properly there. I mean, you really start facing some issues with the database, and it's going to be time to switch to the database. Right. So, if you take a look at how cost free is going to be, with clustering is awesome. Yeah, and it's just really fast. Right. And if you want to do clustering with MySQL, that's fine. <laughs> If you can afford it, just go to the SQL Server box. Maybe I'll go with an Oracle, but even Postgre is offering a pretty awesome clustering, which is pretty simple to set up. And it's an often often an Oracle, so you know what to do. And Postgre is fine. Are we planning to like create the code from InfoSec? Like this in InfoSec? It's the other way around. How are we planning to use InfoSec over the InfoSec? That's the, that's the question we should ask. Right? The other way around. So the idea is that we start. So we currently have, for example, a command part, right, which is pretty hard coded into what we do. So one of the one of the virtual refactoring tasks will be simply switching out that command and replacing it with this one. And then we will do it like you like you did piece by piece, right? But there won't be a big bang. So Simply starting to reuse or starting to use modules of the framework and replace it and turn it into the, the hardware infrastructure. And then we will start layering it on top. And at the end of the day, we should be done. Yeah? So, just thinking about that, do you, I mean, is it built in the spring that you know the checksum of every particular component after it's compiled, versioning? So you're able to sort of do a forensic on a system and know exactly sort of you know which things have been updated, which things haven't. You know, where the library based? That's something we really need to be doing. Just thinking about security too, like how do you maintain how do you make sure that the instance you run that you don't tamper with are there mechanisms to to that or you don't know? But that's something we need to think about. We could always do that at a, at a node level. I mean, I'm running this on a compute node or on a whatever node. And I can make sure that node itself is secure and you know, mm -hmm. So I think what we could have uh, instance level. Right? What's it called? Huh? What's it called? It's good. So, um, as I said, there's no real pre built mechanism. So you could have hash values there for sure and say, okay, let me drop my hand mm -hmm. check some. Right, and you start to check some again. But it's not really good when you do anything like that. That's something we need to add on top to the NPS, which is not that hard. But I think this case, it, as an application developer, I really don't care about that because it's simply a full structure. Mm -hmm. right, so if somebody has wanted to make sure that nobody touched the system, right, there are another tools around that simply scans the, the this and checking the sum of everything, but that's one reason why I don't care about it, because there's enough infrastructure of servers already doing right. exactly that. So why should I care about it? Yeah, perhaps I could just put it into a Git project and uh, check if there's any tips. I mean, I can, I can find my own ways. Yeah, but usually, as I said, there's enough infrastructure service around that exactly the other tools. Watch your disks and watch your stuff that's on there. So you don't really need to care about that. So that's what we talked about during lunch, right? Because it's not my business domain to check if somebody figured and played around with that stuff on this. There's another domain who's definitely you know better than I how to check if you stayed on the business chain. Right, because we need to we need to tweet check something like that, right? Yeah, and it's sort of in this absurdity, right? Once we end up there. Yeah. Okay. But it is a financial application, so maybe maybe that's not the right thing to focus on, but just you know, maybe there's some things that we haven't thought of. We're focusing on that, but on a totally different level, and that's where we talk about how we look at for that stuff at the end of the day. Uh -huh. And I'm sure that once we're a few 
comfortable with what we're talking about, we will share it and then we'll see what we can do on the, on the complete infrastructure. And because it's even more than an application, right? And we need to secure databases, we need to secure networks, we need to find a way how you can have multiple subnets so that no one can really dive through your system and run through some level that you know, the rest of the right? So there's way more than something you need. A piece of code that technically So, as I said, those are the backbone libraries. Right? So, we will provide some services on top of it. So, one is, for example, a transaction service that will utilize the accounting component. And we also will have a portfolio so product portfolio management that will create ledgers and accounts and things like that, provide rules. Uh, this will also use the same. Um, kind of library at the end, so storing the same database. But the, the lab of viewer, if you're not wanting to create your own modules, you want to use our default modules, then you can simply use it as today as Microsoft. But then it will be a bundle of multiple libraries that simply do some business value. Because there's no, there's, to be honest, I mean, there's no business value in that component. It's simply writing a journal, setting some accounts, doing some magic like the, the trial balance or the trial accounting, but there's no business value. It's really the backbone, wrapping the storage of how to deal with leisure and general. That's all of these components. Yeah. 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 For sure you will have. So it comes into the tax customer. Yeah. But not at this level. It's not at that stage. Oh, you're still building this. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Sorry. Good concept. So this is the identity management component we talked about with prior. Right? Uh, okay. So the identity, identity management component will also split into two different components. At the end of the day, you will have one component that's using staff clients or whatever. That's what I meant by we will maybe utilize <coughs> the concept of roles in the future more than we can do. And so we will have a user object, and then the role determines if it's a staff member or if it's a user, a consumer in this case, or maybe if it's a supervisor or whatever. Or a system service. Or, right, or a system service, which we don't currently have. Yes. And that the role then will determine what this specific entity is. Instead of having multiple kinds of entities and try to mix them up and mess everything up, we simply would have an entity and then we can find by role what this role is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 